Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to Visual Radio. It is December 15th. I think it's, Paul, is it December 15th? Sounds right. Which means Christmas is a week and a half away. Yeah, unfortunately. So inundated with Christmas music, I can't uh, fathom it. But on November 19th, thanks to you, I was over at Winchester Town Hall for a boxing event. Yeah. Which, and, and for our viewers, all of you, hundreds of viewers who have viewed the Rob Gronkowski video, we thank Paul for that. I just uploaded the full length, 19 minute, and it got like 70 Rob, hits right away. Yeah, he's having quite a year. We picked the right year to have him, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Then Paul, you go and bring Dana Rosenblatt, dangerous Dana Rosenblatt, yeah. and Irish Mickey Ward. Yeah. These great names. Two former champions. Um, one thing, and if Dan, if you could tell Joe LaRocca, I think we're having problems with okay. the logo. Um, two what names? Two former champions. Two champions, yeah. Yeah. Now, what kind of champion was Dana? Of a middleweight or? I'm not sure of the weight class, but I know there were two you know, world champions. So that was pretty impressive to have them in the same arena, like you said, down at Winchester Town Hall on the same evening for a local cause. They really added to the event. I go in there and there's a guy named Chris, one of your bouncers, brought me right upstairs to the balcony. I got a great angle. Yeah. And we got 39 minutes and 30 seconds of video, which is probably airing on wing cam right now. Great. But I thought we'd bring you in and talk a little bit about it. I appreciate the opportunity, yeah. You know, I, you know um, I'm the president of the Winchester Field Development Council, okay. which has been in existence now for just about two years. And we were assigned the task of raising private funds for the Manchester Field um, Renovation Project. So we have to keep re recreating ourselves uh, with these fundraisers because you know we just don't want to make it uh, an auction or a dance. We want to try and be creative and give, give our very generous donors an opportunity to have some fun and get something back in return. You know, we've had a Kentucky Derby raffle in the past. Um, we've had uh, a walkathon in the past. And we thought this was a really unique opportunity to bring something to Winchester that hasn't been seen maybe, maybe ever or for as long as I can remember. And uh, we always like to do things in a, in a first-rate quality uh, production manner, too. And uh, with the help of USA Boxing, the West Point cadets that came up, and the several uh, uh, amateurs from around the region were able to pull that off. Of course, we had some great sponsors, and we had the interest from the community and just outside the community that made it a, a great, great night. And one, I'd like to just add, too, one, one thing we added right at the very end, which really made it special, was there's a local um, student athlete from Winchester, ninth grader, uh, Lucas Laconte Bautiste. He's, he's our first boxing match on this. Oh, is he? Okay, he's yeah. He's the first one I taped. He's, he's a great kid, comes from a great family, and uh, he's got a lot of talent. You'll be hearing his name a lot in the boxing world in, in the future. He's only in the ninth grade here at Winchester High School, and he, uh, he really added to our, our ticket that night. Now, there were nine events, and I taped uh, the last three. Okay. So the Winchester match we got, okay. which is good. Yeah. And then the, the last one was a fellow from Woburn. Uh, yeah, second to last. They, his nickname was Rosie, and uh, he works out of uh, uh, boxes out of the uh, MK Boxing Facility in Woburn, over Cummings Park. So that was that's worth getting too, and for for the local. Yeah. And we, we broadcast in Woburn, so that's good to know. What I did with the camera was I, I panned the audience, and it was uh, one of our Mr. Doucette, one of our members was in the audience. Right. Yeah. I zeroed in on him, but you had the place packed. Yeah. And there was a 29-year-old boxer from Medford. I'm from Medford, and then his father, and they were talking to me. And so you had Medford residents right. and people from all over. It wasn't just Winchester. Yeah, events like these, what we, what we learned was each boxer has their own following. Oh. So a lot, a lot of people came in support of a particular boxer. And then obviously the West Point kids were from all over the country. Uh, one of them was from Las Vegas. And just the West Point uh, name alone, people wanted to come and see that, uh, see that quality and pay tribute. And uh, it was just a great, great evening. You know? Then we had a, a local resident and teacher at Winchester High School, uh, Sharon Martin, singing the national anthem. And uh, like you said, in, in the audience too, it was the who who's of uh, Winchester. We had people from the ages of uh, 18 to probably 80. And there was those two pretty girls, are they from one of the restaurants? They're, they were actually uh, uh, courtesy of one of our sponsors, the Black Horse Tavern and the Cavino family down in Winchester. Yeah, there, there are two uh, waitresses down there and they volunteered to be our, our ring girls, which added to the event too. They were over the top. Yeah. They, they played it to the <laughs> It hill. was Las Vegas style. Yeah, really. <laughs> and, but, you know, it was a fun. Yeah. Boxing's not my thing. I had fun. 
Mm -hmm. I went out there with the, I'm happy with the video camera. Yeah. When I get the camera, I'm, I'm doing my craft, I'm happy. Seeing something that I'm not really a fan of, it really was an interesting evening for me and I had fun. Mm -hmm. So you put on a very entertaining event. The kids, the ninth graders, were like a street fight. Yeah. It was interesting where they don't have maybe the finesse of the older boxers. They're swinging at each other, and you really kind of worry about them because it looks like a street match. Well, well like with the difference between amateur and professional is the obvious, the amount of, the amount of rounds they fight. There's only three rounds, three-minute rounds. Hey, Kevin, can you put the wide shot on? Yeah. Right now, thanks. So there was, there was three three-minute rounds, and it's unlike a professional fight where they have to pace themselves for 15 rounds or 12 rounds. They just go toe-to-toe -to -toe for, for three rounds and uh, let the best man win. And as, a, as violent it looks, you know, it's actually one of the safer sports because they trained well. They have the proper equipment. You saw the headgear. Yeah. The gloves are much much lighter than and bigger than they would wear in a professional fight. And everybody's getting hit from the front. No sucker punches. Nobody's getting hit from behind or anything. And the quality was was very very good. Uh, we even got comp compliments from uh, the USA Boxing uh, members that were in, uh, on site and the boxers themselves said this was a very well run event and they'd come back again anytime and do it. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm sorry we didn't have two cameras there. I'm sorry I wasn't there for the whole night. No, I appreciate the work that <laughs> you do and, and your show does and the, the people down here at WinCam. It's just great because, you know, even though we had a packed house of a, roughly 400 people, still hundreds of people that weren't able to make it for one reason or another and now they have the opportunity to see it. Yeah, and um, to put 400 people in Winchester Town Hall, I was talking the, to the people from Medford, and we couldn't do that in Medford City Hall. As big as City Hall is, right. it's, it's kind of like sectioned off. Yeah. You, you know, Joe, when we first started to come up with the idea for this event, our original thought was, let's hold it outside right on the new field. And then we said, well, then there's the weather element. Yep. I, didn't, I wanted yep. to be able to sleep at night. Then we said, well, maybe we could cover up the field with a tent. And then talking to the, um, the boxing people, because of the lighting required, you need special tenting and everything. And we said, you know what? It was in the fall also. A lot of high school sports and youth sports uh, have to utilize that field. So we said, let's find a location. And we looked around surrounding towns and stuff, and we really wanted to hold it in Winchester. And the, and the folks down at Town Hall were gracious enough to uh, allow us that opportunity, and it worked out beautifully. It really, it really had like a 1940s <laughs> uh, feel to it, you know, with the, with the balcony seating and the woodwork that's uh, down there. Town Hall was beautiful. Well, that was my next thing, the balcony, because we don't have that in Medford, and I'm up on the balcony, and I have the camera at an angle, and I'm very fortunate the footage came out awesome because of that angle where mm -hmm. Chris put me. Yeah. I was out of the way, I had electricity, it was awesome, yeah. and I was able to get a nice, it looks like Joe LaRocca was editing, and he said it looks like a major league fight. Yeah, you could put that, you could put that like, a, it looked like ABC, Why World of Sports did it or something. Yeah, um, hey, we have our switcher in there. Yeah, long shot. Thank you very much. Um, so, so, okay, so let's, we have about another uh, six, seven minutes. Okay. Uh, the first match was these high school kids. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to make it sound like that they were really, you know, being savage with each other. But um, there was just this element of like, wow, really going at it. Well, I know, like I said, they take great pride. Uh, I know Luca does take great pride in, 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 his, in his sport and he trains very hard at it. And the other young fellow, I forget his name right now, but he was from the Worcester Boys and Girls Club. And Luca is well known uh, uh, in, the, in the boxing prof amateur profession as, as a quality fighter. So this young man came down from Worcester looking for the challenge and, and Luca stepped up to it and they put on a great show. I'm sure Luca was extra pumped up. He had many family members there, many friends from his school and he was fighting in his hometown. So that, you know, anybody that's ever played sports before knows when you're playing in front of your home uh, town and your family, you get a little more adrenaline flowed, and, and uh, those guys went. I think they could have went like that for 15 rounds. Absolutely. Yeah. The next round was um, the uh, the next fight was a fellow from uh, Washington D.C. West Point. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, West Point had fellows from uh, Washington D.C., Las Vegas, uh, all the way out to California, and they run a really good program down there, as you can imagine, in the, in the military. Th those fellows came up uh, the night before, stayed at the Hilton and Woburn and uh, they enjoyed a nice dinner down at the Black Horse Tavern, and they were just all class. When they came into the arena, it was, thank you, sir, thanks for having us, sir, uh, and, they, and they, they, they really represented the, the academy very well, I thought. Let's have the whole world go to West Point. We need more. <laughs> that wouldn't be a bad thing. No, it would be yeah. nice to have people polite in this. You yeah. know, that, that's a good to hear. It's yeah. refreshing. Yeah, and I, I think I, my personal feeling, too, is really, it really adds to the show. I mean, when we, put, when we put that on our headline, it was like, wow, really? That and Luca's name drew a lot of attention. Interesting. Yeah. 
And then you had, and then the third fight was again. We talked about the Woburn, and who did he battle? Uh, I'm drawing a blank in my memory right now, but uh, uh, well, we have his, it name here. Is, his name is uh, John, uh, Jonathan uh, Rosenbaum from Woburn. He fights out of MK Boxing in Woburn, and he's I believe that made him five and zero or four and zero. And uh, I know with the gym, they they speak about him very highly as having a bright future, you know. So uh, he's he's a hard working fellow. He's matter of fact one of the fellows that commented that. Uh, one of the best shows he's ever been involved with, and he'd come back next year if we do it next year. Now, who did the program? There, were, there was a really nice program for this event. Oh, I, well, we've been very blessed. Uh, the WFDC has, you know, we don't have any professional fundraisers on our staff. They're all people from Winchester. We have housewives, we have small business people, and everybody donates their time. And Lisa Pasilli, Kim Mullen, and Ann McCarthy, three local residents, three mums. Um, uh, Put that whole program together for us, and without their expertise, we wouldn't have had a program. Wow! You know, yeah. So they did a good job, and obviously our sponsors were great, and uh, uh, and people that took the time to uh, take out some advertising in that program uh, came out really nice. And um, Irish Mickey Ward, and we have a what? Talk up, talk up. Hey, thanks, Kevin Russo, our director. Thank you. Have See a good you, night. All right, shut the door, please. Oh no. Yep. Thank you. And. Uh, Uh, Mickey Ward and yep. Dana Rosenblatt, how did they get involved? Uh, uh, Dana is actually friends with the uh, Lucas family. So he came with Luca, uh, Bo uh, Luconti Bautista's family. And um, Al Valenti, who works for USA Boxing, was instrumental in Mickey Ward's uh, career. And he asked him to come down, and uh, he was very gracious. Uh, before the fights, we had a VIP party, uh, courtesy of Lucia's restaurant mm -hmm. on, on Mount Vernon Street. And he was there with, um, Mickey Ward showed up with uh, our special VIP sponsor guest. And he, he auctioned off a pair of signed gloves and also the opportunity to have dinner with Mickey and four guests. And in total, that raised us like $7,200. That's amazing. Yeah. Totally amazing. Yeah, and he's just a great guy uh, to talk to and hear, you know, everybody that's seen the, the, the fight, the fighter knows his story. And uh, he did give us a little hint that I don't think was a big surprise, but they are in the works of putting out another sequel to that to that movie so that should be interesting I've been reading yeah. that yeah two questions and I'll let you get off the hot seat uh, yeah. will you be doing another event like this uh, another boxing event we hope to yes yeah I think you know it was, it was very well received and then we'd like to do at least uh, one one every year it was very not only was it successful as far as you know the coordination of it but the bottom line is we want to raise money for the for the uh, Manchester field renovation project and we were successful in doing that so I would like to do that again next year, yes. And yeah. you gave me Al's phone number. Um, if you and Al would like to be on the show, Visual Radio, sure. we can talk this about all this stuff. Okay, definitely, yeah. I'm you know. to, Al's actually a Metford guy, too. Oh, he is? Yeah. Valenti, his, his grandfather was Rip Valenti, who was a big-time uh, boxing promoter back in the day and uh, ticket man. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that would be awesome. So, you know, the, the door's always open here. We're, I appreciate it, Joe. Um, we were on Thursday nights, 8 o'clock, here in Winchester. Um, we're booking for next year already, which is pretty great. Great, yeah. Yeah, and uh, well, like I said, we appreciate it. You know, as a community member here, appreciate all the good work you do, and hope uh, you hope you keep it up. It, you know, it's it's just been great having teamwork. Yeah. We have a great team here at WinCam, and you've been very important to us. Thank well, you, Paul. Well, thank you very much, Joe. Paul Munganaro, and yeah. could you send Joe or Anthony in? I will. And you you can bring That's the mic out with you. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much, Paul Munganaro. Uh, who helped put together our Rob Gronkowski tape and this wonderful boxing event. And we have two more guests tonight. Carolyn Preston, I'm going to call right now. And she has this incredible book, The Scrapbook of Frankie Pratt. Full color, vintage memorabilia on every page. Author of Jackie by Josie. So I'm going to call her. In about 20 seconds, I just want to do a little fine-tuning with my staff. Um, ah, there we go. That's the fine-tuning I wanted. Thank you very much. All right, so now we're going to call Caroline. Um, hey, uh, Joe or Anthony, someone, come in here because we have a brand-new system, people. We have a brand-new system, and your microphone I might need to put on the telephone. The, I'm going to call Carolyn, but I don't have a mic on the telephone, so oh, yes. Joe LaRocca of The Wonderful Show is here. Thank you, Joe LaRocca. Wonderful Joe LaRocca. Hi, guys. See you later, Kevin. 
Good night, Kevin. And I saw Mission Impossible last night, Joe. I'll sit down and talk to you about it. There. That's ready to go. Call that person in a second. Yeah, I want to talk about Mission Impossible real quick. Oh, All right. I need, a, I need a thing. So we're going to talk about Mission Impossible, and you need someone to put it on the uh, wide shot. So, I like these new mics. It's easy. Okay. I can't review it because there's an embargo till midnight tonight. Oh, come on. There is. I know, but could you really get in trouble? You could say, you could give a non-official review. Uh, well, I'm not going to review it, but I will just say that um, it's good to see Tom Cruise give it back. We could talk about the generalities. Yeah. See, he hasn't been, I can't even think of the last movie he was in. That movie where he spoke German, I think, that went, did really bad at Valkyrie. Yeah, and he does a little of that in here uh, because there's a, we can give the preview, but this is not a review. This is not a preview. A preview, there you go. Um, when you see the trailer, you immediately see the Kremlin blow up. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, boy, when I run my review tomorrow, uh, I can't mention this because this is too much of a spoiler, but they do it right in the, it's an amazing blow up. Special effect. Yeah, and you're thinking of it, Moscow blowing up. I mean, this is going to be huge in Russia. Right. Oh, the movie itself, yeah. Yeah. Well, they always make, they make sure that they make action movies very acceptable to other European countries and the whole world because they sell really well. And, and because action movies don't generally have tons and tons of dialogue, and they usually don't deal with, like, nuanced things that are not universal. It's usually like, that's the bad guy. And even if you don't speak English and you're from some small village in Africa, you know that's the bad guy and that that's the good guy, you know? So, I mean, it makes it marketable internationally. And they go to Mumbai, uh, India. They go to Dubai with this. Yeah, this, <laughs> yeah stand, sandstorm. And the other thing is, I can tell you this, that they used IMAX cameras, but not through the whole movie, but for a lot of the movie. And they're going to do that with the next film, too, I guess, that they're going into the IMAX realm with it. There, you think there's going to be a fifth one? Oh, yeah. I absolutely think there will be. Do you think they'll like, kind of reboot the series with this one, in a way? Like yeah, I think, I, in the butt? I think they did. Yeah. Because, now, let's, let's see. The first two were directed, or the first one was directed by some really good director. Right, and then J.J. Abrams was the last one. And he's a co-producer of this one. Yep, and this one is Brad Bird. He, this is the first live action movie he's done. He was involved in another live action movie, but they shelved it because it was really going into the red. Oh, yeah. And then they did this. So oh, this yeah. is his, like, one and a half. You yeah. can go on to Wikipedia and see it. That's where I read it. Because, yeah, he's, he's really famous for, uh, he was a big deal at The Simpsons for a while. He directed The Simpsons, but then he did uh, The Iron Giant. And Ratul. Ratatouille. Thank you. I can, yeah. I didn't know what that was until I saw it. And uh, The Incredibles, that Pixar movie. So hey, he's like, he's a pretty solid director, you know. Let's do this so I don't get in trouble. Are you going to go see it tomorrow or the next day? I'm going to see it within, the, yeah, probably this weekend. You have an invitation if you want. Next Thursday, we'll talk about it. All right, good. Till then. Till then, guys. I'll come back. I'm going to call Carolyn. If you could okay. give me the... Uh, I'll, I'll make sure the audio is good. Yeah, and the straight shot and then the, uh, and shut the door and that would be great. And now our guest. Hello, Carolyn Preston. Yes. Welcome to Visual Radio. Oh, well, thank you so much. You are on the air. Oh, okay, great. I'm ready to go. I got your book in my hand, and I've got to tell you, not only myself, but uh, the fellow that was just on the air with me, Joe LaRocca, we were stunned by all of the... The book is just marvelous. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you. What a great idea for a book. Uh, and it's called The Scrapbook of Frankie Pratt, a novel in pictures. Um, is this... I didn't see Jackie by Josh. Is this a departure from what you did with Jackie by Josh? Oh, Jackie by Josie. Josie, sorry. So, yes, yeah, yeah. So I've written three, uh, three previous novels, and they are all conventional novels. And this novel, which is in the form of a vintage scrapbook, is a total departure for me. And, uh, but it, it is 
from years of I was an archivist and also I'm being a I'm a big collector of antique scrapbooks and antique ephemera and so I created the scrapbook. Now you're in Charlottesville, Virginia. That's right. Mm -hmm. But you were an archivist at the Peabody Essex Museum. Yes, I was. I was at the, yeah, I was a curator of manuscripts there, and then I worked at the Houghton Library at Harvard. So we, my husband and I, lived up in in um, in the Boston area for twenty years, and um, and he's actually from Cambridge, and. Uh, so, yeah, we lived in Cambridge, and then we lived out in Harvard, Mass. Um, and then what took us to um, Virginia was my husband is a writer, and he got a teaching job at, at um, University of Virginia. Well, when you're both in Boston, just ring us up, and you can be on the air live. All right. I'd well, love to. You're live right now, I mean, in, in studio. Oh, okay. Well, that would be great. We'd love to. In fact, he has a book coming out in May, so I will send him. You know, he will be up in Boston, so that'd be great. Oh, great. It'd be great to see both of you, if, if you can. Yeah, uh, would be. We'd love to. Now, I was at the Peabody Essex Museum taping Laurie Anderson. Were you at that event? No. no. How long ago was that? I'd say it was about eight, nine, ten years ago. No, I haven't been there in a long time. I've okay. I've been there since the early, uh, early 80s. <laughs> oh, okay. Time, isn't it? Yeah. No, in the 90s or in the early 2000s, I did tape the great... Um, Oh, they have a term for what she does. Um, she's very artistic, um, Laurie Anderson. And it's slipping my mind because I have Blueheimers. Don't mind me. Yeah, you're right. I know, <laughs> yes, I know the, fe the feeling, yes. <laughs> but, um, um, this never happened to me before, but in my 50s, you know, it does. Oh, no. Don't we, yeah, well, don't talk about it because it, it, it probably won't get better, do you think? <laughs> I hope it does. But um, yeah. you collected antique scrapbooks since you were in high school. That's right. I did, and um, I loved antique scrapbooks and old things. I mean, I started with looking through my um, my grandmother's scrapbooks that she kept when she was in Paris in the twenties, and then my mother's scrapbooks from the thirties and forties. And so I really, you know, and I love the kind of stories that these scrapbooks told. And so I started collecting old scrapbooks and old Valentines and all sorts of old things, postcards and things. And then, um, and then I went to graduate school in American history, and then I became an archivist for many years. And that sort of spurred this love of visual material. So how many scrapbooks do you think you've personally compiled? I There's a question. probably have about 30. Um, I am a sort of, I mean, I also have a lot of antique ephemera, but... You know, I, the thing about scrapbooks is they're they're pretty big and they're kind of bulky. And okay. So I'm I'm fairly particular about what I collect. Um, uh, otherwise, my house would be overrun with stuff. And so I kind of focus in on collecting things that are really in my interest. And I'm trying to get a ver I have a very kind of representative collection that goes from Victorian era to the modern era. Um, but when I was making the scrapbook of Frankie Pratt, I just was collecting things from the 1920s. And um, it's all this woman's tale um, uh, in the 1920s, and she starts as a, a growing up in a small town in, in or village in New Hampshire, and then she goes to Vassar College and Greenwich Village and Paris all um, during the 20s. And I went and collected 600 over 600 pieces of um, 1920s ephemera and memorabilia to put in to put in this book. What a great idea. So this is actual memorabilia. It is. It is. It is completely, I mean, not only that, but I really made it, I mean, these are actual pages that I glued together. This is not all sort of digitally composed. And um, because I really wanted to sort of have this great authentic look of what a 1920s scrapbook looked like. So I really found all these things and glued them all together. And they allowed you to put a silver certificate in here, which is just amazing, and a dime. Wow. Well, I don't know. I think, I think you, you could, I mean, no one's going to prevent you from doing that. That's beautiful. Um, I just it has money, it has silver spoons and jewelry and, and old tickets and uh, magazine covers and all sorts of old things. Campbell's Condensed Vegetable Soup. I know, I know. These wonderful ads, I looked through, I mean, I collected all these old magazines and, um, um, and, um, 
you know, fashion spreads and, and things that I, that, and, and I, you know, probably went through thousands of old magazines to, um, to find, you know, you know call your Saturday Evening Post, um, all these magazines that don't exist anymore. Um, you know, I cut them up and found all of the advertisements in them, like the Campbell's too bad. Or the Maxwell House Coffee, which, yeah. and Pepo Mint. And even though these are the 20s, uh, you know, me growing up in the 60s, I, I can relate to the Chesterfield cigarettes package. Yeah, yeah, well, there is. I mean, again, there are lots of old candy wrappers and things like that in the book, and, you know, Babe Ruth bar, and, and one of my favorite things in there is an original, a popsicle stick, like, you know, the original popsicle stick that says, you know, patent popsicle, and, you know, so it's from the 20s. Now, um, I, I collect records, Carolyn, and I've oh, never... okay, what kind of records? All kinds of records, but usually in the rock and roll field. I've been a critic of rock music for uh, many, many years, so I have, you know, extensive collection so these are LPs or 45s? Everything. Everything you can imagine. LPs, 45s, cassettes, 8-tracks. But I bring it up because next to your Maxwell House, you've got something I've never seen as a record collector. Emerson Records. Hawaiian Butterfly. Jazz uh, for... And that is a... Oh, what is it? Uh, it is a 5-inch record. It's something of some very bizarre size. Five-inch record? Um, yeah, it's a uh, it. Um, and, and actually, yeah, I did look up about it. Emerson Record um, was a company that recorded, I think, before World War One. I. I mean, it was, had a very short period, and you know, it, there are and and you know, during the early period of records, there, um, there, you know, they were all random sizes. I mean, they, you know, they, there was not a standard size for records. And, I mean, they still had the small hole in the center, but, um, and that, so there was, I mean, this period when they made these little records was just, you know, very short. I mean, it's like three years or something. Yeah, because I was familiar with 10-inch and 12-inch with 78 RPMs, but I never know. a 5-inch. I know, isn't it? It's, it's, it's wonderful looking, and um, I found that in an old antique store. And, you know, I think, as you probably know, you know, old stores usually always have piles of records. Yes. Just the way they have piles of sheet music, you know? Yep. It's like, it's very common, and, and so you always find a big bin of records, and they'll be like a buck a piece or something. I mean, they're usually not very much. And so I went to this big pile of records, and I found this, this crazy little record in there. And it's, I, it's Hawaiian foxtrot, so it's, you know, the you know, Hawaiian music that was played during the 20s. That kind of Love it. Love it. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I know. I, I, anyway, so... That's the kind of thing that I would find. It just would be so exciting. And, um, uh, the, the, you know, things like old records. And, uh, you know, in the back there, I mean, you saw their old um, book covers from, you know, original covers on Also Rises and luggage tickets from the, um, from the Mauritania, you know, one of these Cunard lines. And uh, there's a spoon from an automat. I mean, you just would find all these crazy things. And an envelope, which is really, people just take envelopes for granted, but Madame Roxanne Pratt? Oh, yes. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Now, that envelope, yes, that's, okay, that's, uh, um, well, one of the things when I did this is I was looking for original stationery, blank stationery, and so, you know, I find blank telegrams and blank, I found a piece of stationery from the Mauritania that was blank, and... That particular letter you're talking about, um, it is a is a pneumatic letter. Um, it's in 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 Paris at that time. People sent letters around pneumatically. You know, they had these pneumatic tubes that went under the the city, and they would send these letters back and forth to one another. And that's what people did instead of um, calling one another up. So I found some of these blank, I mean, I found them on eBay. I found these blank pneumatic stationery, French pneumatic stationery that I, you know, then I, then I, wrote, I wrote on them for my book. Uh, it's, it's marvelous. Yeah. And tickets, you have tickets. Admit okay. one. Well, what a great idea. Well, the Coney Island tickets are great. Yeah, Luna Park, World in Wax. That was really great. Uh, that was one of my favorite finds. Um, it's a whole collection of Coney Island tickets, and it has all the different rides, the... Um, you know the loop and the and the camel the camel ride and all sorts of crazy things and um, and they're so beautiful looking because they're all different Thunderbolts and the Wax Museum 
And that's just a, a collection I found of uh, old Coney Island tickets. I found them on eBay. Well, you know, you bring up eBay, and that's interesting because uh, I'm putting a boxed set together for the uh, Bobby Hebb. Remember the song, Sonny? Yes. So uh, I worked for the estate of the late Bobby Hebb. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, we lost Bobby last year, so we're putting together a um, box set. But as Bo when Bobby was alive, we were finding a lot of his materials, acetates, and even reel-to-reel -reel recordings that he had lost on eBay. Can you believe this? Well, I'm not really surprised. I think. And so, what had happened to them? I mean, had he had he? I mean, who? I mean, had he lost them and like put them in storage and lost them or something? He had, had gone through a divorce and yeah. um, his first marriage, and he said, "Joe, when you go through a divorce, you know it's so traumatic. You don't really keep track of everything because you're going through that whole thing." And he's a, he was meticulous in how he kept his house in order and all his records filed. And, but there are over a thousand versions of Sonny, so I would be on eBay finding different ones he didn't have and shipping them down to him, you know? Um, we had a lot of fun with that. So, things, so did they all turn up together or they were turning up separately? Oh, separately, separately. And we'd find things that an artist like Bobby, who had toured the world with the Beatles, well, he had toured America with the Beatles, he toured with so many different people, um, he probably wasn't aware of this because there was no eBay at the time. But in 1966, they took his promotional photo, and the different countries around the world would either reverse it, so you'd see him, it, he'd look like he was left-handed when he's actually right-handed. Yeah. Or they would take the photo and uh, shoot it down or blow it up. So it was in all these different configurations in different countries. Uh-huh. And you'd never know that as an artist unless you're going into the record stores to see your own record. Right. What, what, yes, we, yeah, exactly how these versions turn up. And they turn up on eBay, uh, you know, 30, 40 years later. Well, you know, I think it's really good that it turns up on eBay and isn't just destroyed, because I think a lot of things just get thrown away. Oh, and, and it's, it's amazing. And even just the photos, to see them on eBay, it's, it's, um, it's an incredible resource. And I'm glad that, you know, you, you were able to work with it for your book. Uh, well, I was, and I did find a lot of things. And, and fortunately for me, I was collecting things that aren't particularly, that, you know, particularly in demand or... You know, it isn't like I'm collecting Lionel trains or, I don't know, something that's very collectible that everybody wants. Um, so, you know, this is just 1920s postcards or cheap music or things like that. And, and you know, it's not, it's not terribly expensive. Be content. Riches will come. Success. I love it. A little positive thinking card from Collier's or on the Collier's page. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, those are little fortune-telling cards I have found. And they're kind of scattered throughout. I really love old card games. And so I found, you know, she's from the 1920s, so I found all sorts of card games that she would play, such as authors or touring, which is kind of an early version of Milbourne. And then I found these little fortune-telling cards, which is about, you know, you'll meet a mysterious stranger and you'll have success. And so I kind of scattered them around through the different pages. Oh, it's just totally amazing. Now, you've written previous books that were um, novels. Right, that's right. I've written three uh, earlier novels. And does Gatsby's Girl have anything to do with Gatsby? Yes, it does. Um, Gatsby's Girl is about um, F. Scott Fitzgerald's first girlfriend uh, named Ginevra King, and he met her when he was in college. And she was a wealthy girl from Illinois. And, you know, he just felt totally in love with her and really felt, you know, and just had this mad crush on her. And it was unrequited, and she ended up marrying somebody else. And so he preserved, you know, he, he, this, this memory of Ginevra King was very powerful for him, and he, and he eventually turned it, that story into The Great Gatsby. Ah. She was the model for Daisy Buchanan. Okay. And so when I was looking, um, when I was working, um, looking for my third novel, I came across this old scrap. I mean, it wasn't an original. It was a copy um, of, an, of the scrapbook that, that um, F. Scott Fitzgerald kept. He kept an amazing scrapbook of his whole life and about his, um, you, know, j you know, just about his, his development as a writer and, you know, all of his sort of adventures. And, and you know, I mean, so, and he wrote about his successes and he wrote about all his failures, too, in the scrapbook. He collected it. And I just found the, the, the story, you know, his scrapbook, so poignant and 
realizing the kind of story you could tell by keeping your menus or your tickets or your, just your little ephemera of your life. And, and so that's what really inspired me to do this book. That's fascinating. So it brings me to the next question, which is, how did you develop the scrapbook of Frankie Pratt? You c came up with a fictional character. I did. I did. I mean, yeah, um, yeah the question is, how did I do it? Did I, and what, what came first? And the, I first, I mean, I decided I would try and make this scrapbook of, of this woman in the 20s, and I wanted her to be a small town girl or from a very, you know, rural area of New Hampshire, and then to be exposed to, you know, the wider world's coming-of-age story, and the story starts when she's 18, and so I wanted her to go to college, and I wanted her to go to Greenwich Village and to Paris. Um, you know, these kind of the most exciting periods of, of life, at, you know, probably at any time. Um, uh, and so then I, so I had this idea, and then I started collecting things to, to fill in the story. I mean, I found some um, yearbooks from Vassar, and I found, you know, things like the, the Coney Island tickets or... Uh, automat things or magazines of things, um, and and so I started. I, I looked. I mostly I went to a lot of antique stores and kind of you know this kind of funky antique malls. You see, like you know, on the side of the road, you know, sure. you see dealers in a barn or something. And I just found all this stuff, and then I also went on eBay looking for very specific things. And then as I found things that surprised me, like the Coney Island tickets or some of the things you've mentioned, then I would sort of incorporate, then I changed the story a little bit. So it kind of went back and forth. I cool. came up with a character, and then as I found things, I changed her story. Now, is Shakespeare in his characters, or are the characters um, extensions of Shakespeare? Is this an extension of you? Um, no, I, no, I, well, no, it, 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 I, no, I don't think so. No, not at all. I mean, I, you know, I'm not from New Hampshire. I'm from Illinois. And, uh, um, but he is inspired by some things. I mean, my grandmother was very good friends with a woman named Sylvia Beach, uh, who started a famous bookstore in Paris in the 20s. And so I had a lot of her memorabilia. So there are some of my own family's adventures in Paris. And I mean, one of the reasons I was so interested in Paris in the 20s was because because my grandmother had lived there, so okay, so that's one of the reasons. And and then the other thing is, I've just always found the twenties incredibly glamorous and exciting, and always really wish I had lived in that period. So I think, in a way, I tell people it isn't my life, but you know, I sort of like I'm getting a chance to do some time travel. I mean, you know, if I could go live that life, I would. Time travel, that's great. Yeah, it is. It was totally time travel. I mean, it was so much fun for me to do this book. Now, you thank your fantastic editor, Lee Boudreau. Yes, yes. What, did you take them by surprise when you pitched this type of an idea? I really did. I mean, I had, I had um, written three traditional novels, and I was sort of struggling with a fourth. And, you know, my agent thought I was going to be writing, I said I was going to try and write something about Ulysses being, James Joyce's Ulysses being published in Paris, and so much had been written on that, and, you know, I just got discouraged, so I came up with this crazy idea about doing a scrapbook novel, and, you know, I didn't tell anyone, and I sort of told my husband, you know, he was saying, well, you really need to go write a book and make some money, and I said, well, I've got this great idea, and, you know, he'd look in my office, and there I was with scissors blue and cutting up a bunch of old magazines. Um, so I put together the first chapter, and then we sold it on the basis of that. But yeah, people were surprised. <laughs> I mean, you know, my, my agent was surprised, and, and my um, I hadn't worked with Lee Boudreau before, so, you know, she kind of bought it on the basis of seeing that first chapter. But I think people were taken with it. I think, you know, people were always looking for something different, and you know, I think they were excited by the idea that you could tell a novel or create a novel or tell a story uh, in this way. Well, I think it's visionary because I'm of a mind that people like the familiar and especially the forgotten familiar. And I think you bring people back to the forgotten familiar. 
I, I think that's really true, and I think, you know, the thing about these sort of objects from the past is they tell an incredible story, and I think we all have that experience by finding a box that belonged to, you know, one of our grandparents or our parents, and just these little souvenirs of their own lives. It's so evocative. It is, and, you know, it just can tell you so much more about what they did in their life than than them sitting and telling you, you know, their stories. You find some of their letters and some of the things they kept, you know, it, it tells a very, it, it, it's, it's amazing the kind of storytelling that, that that can do. Griddle cakes and syrup, only 40 cents at Smith Brothers Restaurant. I know, I know, and the Smith Brothers Restaurant, um, well, you know, Smith Brothers cough, cough drops? Yep. Uh, yeah, well, anyway, they, they were, there were some Smith Brothers, and they had a luncheonette in, uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York, and so, it, which I learned, and so... You know, and then I learned, that, you know, that's the, they were the ones who started their their cough their cough drop businesses, and um, is in Poughkeepsie. So oh, that is an old menu I found from Smith Brothers. So th that's an actual menu. You, you let people. A menu. Wow. <laughs> I know. I know with those those prices. You know, you know the, you know the dollar or the eighty cents for the griddle cakes and everything. It's it's pretty pretty wonderful. Womanhood and Marriage by Bernard McFadden. Bernard McFadden, he is, well, he's someone I've always been kind of fascinated with. Bernard McFadden started the, the, the confession magazines um, in the 1920s, like True Romance and True Confessions. I know of them, but I didn't know that, that he was one of the... He was the one who started it. Wow. And um, those, that, those magazines had the widest circulation of any magazines in, in the country in the 1920s. And the other thing about him is he was a real health nut, and he was the first, you know, he started a, a, um, a magazine called Physical Culture, which was about, you know, exercising and, you know, and eating, being a vegetarian, and, you know, it was, people didn't know about that then. I mean, it was a completely revolutionary idea, and, you know, he was kind of a crazy person, as, he, as I show in my book, you know, he loved to do pictures, that, you know, show pictures of himself when he was, you know, without a shirt on, and he was like, you know, 60 years old. So he was a, he was a crackpot, but, um, you know, a lot of the things he wrote about was, um, you know, was true. There is sunshine behind the clouds. Love your own life. Yeah. Your troubles will soon disappear. These are the fortune-telling cards. The fortune-telling cards at the end of the book, you know, and all those little things turned out to be kind of prophetic in her life. And, and it was, but it, you know, it's so fun for me. I'd find these little playing cards and things, and then, you know, I would find a place where they fit into her scrapbook because, you know, that was the, the little fortune would, would tell, you know, would, would be prophetic for what's happening in her life. Now, where you grew up with scrapbooks, I grew up on Marvel Comics, the early Spider-Man and yes. X-Men and yes, yes, yes. Fantastic Four. And, and so this, to me, is, is like reading a comic book, which appeals to me. It touches my heart. Well, I, I grew up with comic books, too, and I really love comics. Um, I, you know, I had, um, I mean, I had Superman comics and, and, and things like Archie comics and and there were also love comics. You probably don't know about those, but there were all these comics for girls. Oh, I did. Uh, oh, yeah. And um, so anyway, in fact, and so anyway, I, I love my comics. And then my mother threw away my comic book collection, which I think is a pretty common thing where people always say, "Oh, I wish my mother hadn't thrown it away." Um, but anyway, my next book is going to be set in. Uh, it's going to be a bride scrapbook from 1959 to 1960. So. Whoa. I am going back, and I'm finding all these old comic books that I'm going to put in it, so it's kind of fun. Oh, that's, that's a neat idea. So do you still have your comic books? Um, you know, I sold them maybe um, 1998, because uh, 1998. I was going on a trip, and I figured, you know, if I want them back, I'll buy a comic book store, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why? They're sitting in the house, and they can do someone some good, and I've got my records, and how much stuff can I collect? Well, it is true. You do have to, at some point, you have to sort of put your foot down and say, I can't collect everything, because then you're going to be like out of those hoarder programs, right? Well, yeah, I'm borderline. I have a storage room, and I have, you know, a lot of stuff in the house. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on the way, and I don't want to be there, you know? 
Right, right. Well, you, you, well, that's good. No, that's right. You just have to put your foot down. Besides, you can't take care of all that stuff. No, you can't. No. I mean, comic books, you've got to really take care of them I mean, because they're kind of uh, perishable. You've got to board and bag them, and it's like 10 cents, which is not, a, not expensive to get a board and a bag, you know? And it's a little cardboard that goes in the plastic yeah. bag, and you put your book in there. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't do that as a kid because I was just obsessed with them. Oh, because you read them, and they probably were all dog-eared and everything, right? I reread them, and I reread them, but I had some pretty early issues, so... And, and some of them were in good condition because, you know, uh, I had the whole Silver Surfer, the first run, and that was kind of cool. Uh, he's become such an important character. So, collectors, I I whether it's scrapbooks or comic books or records, we have a, um, some kind of a common ground. That's right, except I think, I think that things like scrapbooks, I mean, they're very interesting, but they're not, very, they're not collectible the way um, records and um, the way records and comic books are. But, you know, there is, a, there is a common problem with all of them is they're very perishable. Yes. Um, I mean, you know, scrapbooks are made of very pulpy paper, and so obviously so are comic books and records. How do you preserve all those records? Well, there's a, a movement making the comic books all digital, which is a whole other thing. And um, it kind of, um, I'm, I'm not into it yet, you know, where you can go online and read the they're, comic book digitally. Is this, is this new comic books or preserving old comic books? Both. They're doing the whole, you know, um, I haven't really got into it, but I know that they're putting the comic books digitally into the, uh, the cloud, if you will, that they call it. So, you know, all the comic books will be there. The first Superman, the first Spider-Man, what was it, Amazing Stories 42 or whatever. Um, that stuff will be digitally preserved. So even when the books disintegrate, it'll be on some electronic... Uh, well, I suppose that's right. And they probably are preserving... Um, obviously, records have to be preserved the same way, right? And, and yes, and as you said, with the, um, the eBay... Finding these Bobby Hebb photos, to me, it's just a miracle because those little paper sleeves, which I would buy them all, of course. So we have all those Bobby Hebb records, but there they are on the web, and we use it on his website. Oh, great. Now, are, they, are these things expensive? Uh, it depends. Uh, one of his records goes for over $100. You want to change me. Mm -hmm. It was a brilliant song by Gamble and Huff, who, were, who did the big Philly sound in 72, 73 with the OJs and the spinners, but they were working with Bobby Hebb on a 45, and I think it was only a promotional 45, and it's become this huge underground uh, northern soul hit. Northern soul's a phenomenon in England, and so collectors are going nuts to find it because it's a great record. It should have been a big, big hit. Well, I mean, so when you find these old records, are, are, they, are they scratched? Is the fidelity good on them? Oh, some of the, well, where it's promotional only, uh, the, pr the fidelity is usually great. Uh, the copy I bought was about $30 and it is scratched. But you're able to get better versions and, you know, working with Universal Music, we'll get the original master tape now. Hmm. We're okay. going to reissue it on the box set. Oh, good. Yeah, so it'll be preserved and it'll be, it'll sound incredible because we'll have, um, I already have picked the mastering engineer to reconstruct the sound digitally. It's going to be great. In a way, you're really preserving, you're preserving, um, I mean, obvi well, obviously you're preserving it, and, um, or even making it better and more available than it ever was. And, you know, the, in a way, uh, that, the, uh, that impulse when I was creating the scrapbook, um, you know, I did it, sort of have that same impulse, because the problem with scrapbooks, as wonderful as they are, is you can't really, they're really hard to look at, because they're always, they basically are fall apart in your hands, you know, they just... They're so pulpy, and all the pictures fall out, and things like that. So I really wanted to create a scrapbook. It was really beautiful. That had amazing stuff in it, and that you could look at without without worrying about it falling apart. And Carolyn, you succeeded. Oh, thank you. you I know. I know. Well, it was, it was really, really exciting and fun to do. I mean, it was yeah. You know. It's a treat. It's one of the most fascinating books I've come across all year. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much. Well, you, good. Well, look out for my next one because. Um, you know, that's, that's my, ne yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll hopefully my next one will be on about a year. Well, great. And, and the last thing I'm going to ask you is, uh, is your website carolynpreston.com? carolynpreston.com. 
That's good enough. I thank you so much for being on Visual Radio tonight. So much for your wonderful questions. And yeah, my website has a lot. It has a lot about my collections in it and how I made the book. It has some videos about about the book. So yes, please go check it out. CarolynPreston.com. Thanks again. Happy holidays. Same to you. Thanks okay. so much for calling. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Wow, what a great guest. And now it's time for our movie tomorrow night, which is Scrooge. And Frank Delastrito hasn't been on in two weeks. And I have a new phone number for Frank tonight. Perfect timing. Oh, Strito, talking about movies. Bah humbug. Oh, dear. Okay, Joe, I see you're in the holiday season. How you doing? I watched it online be doing a little prep, and I heard him do the bah humbug. Yep. It's great. Hey? Huh? Anyway, I guess your viewers have guessed that the movie is Scrooge. Tomorrow night, people, Scrooge at Winkham, Friday night at the movies. Yep. Uh, 1935, the first sound version of Scrooge. Uh, the night, uh, Seymour Hicks plays Scrooge, and he had played Scrooge maybe thousands of times on stage. And this was his second film appearance as Scrooge. The first one was in 1913 in a uh, silent film. And then, uh, then he made the first uh, talkie film 22 years later, and that's what you're going to sh show tomorrow night. And uh, let's see. Uh, one thing to remember about Seymour Hicks, he was one of these grand old Victorian actors, and they usually became producers with their own company. So when he went into movies, he tried to get into production. And he was making a short film. He got in a f fight with a director. He fired a director and hired a young guy named Alfred Hitchcock, who had <laughs> never directed before. <laughs> wow. That's his claim to posterity. And what film was that? Do you remember? Oh, it's a short film. I believe it is lost. It's called Always Tell Your Wife. It was probably uh, one reel, so 12 minutes. Uh, it was silent. And I can't find any trace of it. I'm not, I'm not a specialist at those things, so uh, somebody else might be able to find a copy somewhere, but I think it's probably lost. Hey, Francis Ford Coppola goes to Roger Corman, and uh, Alfred Hitchcock goes to Seymour Hicks. You got, you got that. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, let's see. What's your favorite version of A Christmas Carol? Well, uh, I'm not well versed in it. Okay. So, um, My favorite version came three years later, the MGM version starring Reginald Owen as Scrooge, 1938. A lot of people, uh, the 1951 British version with Alastair Sim is their, their version, but I, I can't think of a story that has more film versions then A Christmas Carol, it seems we get a new one every year. And uh, for a while, I, I, I tried to watch a different one every Christmas. That became my Christmas tradition, was seeing a, what new version or different version of A Christmas Carol could I watch. And I g basically gave up on that after about 20 years, because there was always a new one to watch. And so I just settled down on the 1938, which I always make a point of watching at Christmas time. Well, I, I'm amazed that people don't play this free public domain one. Uh on com major commercial stations all the time. It's very good. Yeah, it's not bad at all. Now, I, I will caution your, your viewers that there are some bastardized versions out there that are missing key scenes, and it's, it's, it's not a good movie when they do that. They cut like 20 minutes out of it, which the movie can't stand. But seen in its full length, which I believe is about an hour and 20 minutes, it's, uh, it's not bad at all. It's, uh, it's a bit odd in that you don't see the ghost. The ghosts can only be seen by Scrooge. So at the most, you see a shadow or an outline, but you don't see any ghosts. And uh, I don't know why they did that. I, I don't think it was cost-cutting or budget-cutting or whatever. I just thought it was something we're trying to, trying to pull off. And I, it kind of works. It's, it's, it's odd at first, and you, you, you let down, because you know, some of these ghosts are, are worth seeing, especially Marley and the ghosts of Christmas Future. You want to see how, how gruesome they're going to be. But... Uh, you don't get that in this movie, but this is this is not a bad movie at all. Um, the first version I saw was uh, well, I saw it long ago, and and on television, I guess in the 1980s, and it was uh, abysmal. And then I realized later on that that that's all that was really available, and then and so now the people are lucky that can see the full version online for free. And uh, for uh, an hour and 20, but check the running time of it. It's much less than an hour, 20 minutes. Excuse me. Yeah, an hour, 20 minutes. That's right. So much less than an hour, 20 minutes than look for another one online because they're out there. Well, that's great advice. We've got 30 seconds left, Frank. 
We'll, we'll have a movie for next week. I'll let you know what it is. Okay, next week I'll be in Mexico, so I'm hoping I'll have a phone number you can call. I'm, I'm, I hope my cell phone works. So I'm going to check before I leave. So uh, anyway, uh, if I, uh, I'll talk to you next week, but if not, a Merry Christmas to you, and I'll be talking to you uh, the week after or whatever. Merry Christmas, Frank Delastrito. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Frank Delastrito, that's our visual radio. Great show tonight. Four different guests. Um, thanks to Kevin Russo, Joe LaRocca, and everyone. Good night.